So one of the things, as a, as a preacher, one of the things that I find is always a bit of a struggle is, you ha- is keeping your analogies uh, relevant to the audience that you're talking to. Uh, you know, you can, there's lots of stuff that might uh, seem to me to be a great analogy, but at the end of the day isn't really because if you don't understand the nuances of something, then you're not going to understand it. One of the things I always have to struggle with is not using backpacking stories too much. Uh, it was funny because I had written this whole thing and then yesterday at the barbecue, Rob was bugging me about always talking about stuff like backpacking or when we were doing Tough Mudder, I was preaching about Tough Mudder. And well, you know, I mean, it's, it's a reality, it's my life. Uh, but it's always important to make sure that they're relevant. And this happens with Jesus sometimes too because in the Gospels, it's really easy for us to sort of preach or talk about what Jesus was talking about. But the problem is that Jesus did not live in Barrie in 2023. Jesus was a lower class Middle Eastern gentleman growing up in in Palestine uh, 2,000 years ago. And uh, first century lower class Israel was essentially an agrarian society. The majority of people had some sort of little bit of land. They were farming. They had animals of some kind, at least just sort of household animals, like it's some, you know, their own cows, etc., for milk. A few animals they were raising for offerings and sacrifices, not to mention a lot of sheep farming and all this kind of stuff. And so Jesus uses all of these analogies. And for those of us who have grown up in church, we're like, oh, yeah, that makes fine, perfect sense, no problem. But when you stop and think about it, you realize, wait, no, like nothing in my life is connected at all to that world. I used to live in KW for a while, and we would get phone calls from people wanting to do surveys, uh, asking about feed, what kind of seed you were planting on your farms, that kind of stuff. And I would try to see how long I could go before they realized that I didn't know anything about farming. I was lying through my teeth and just making up answers because they called me, and if they want to waste my time, quid pro quo, you know what I mean? Uh, But I know nothing about farming. I am not a gardener. I I don't think I would actually, outside of, I think I understand seeds go in the ground and then you put water on them. I don't think I would actually know what to do. During the pandemic, the Bent House became a bit of a garden uh, greenhouse for a little while, and it still kind of does in the spring, but, you know, we're looking for something to do. And so for a while, like, the whole kind of window box area and the kitchen table and into Tim's office sort of area and out onto the deck and, you know, and by the front windows and in the bathroom and in Tim. No, it was like it felt felt like there was a lot of plants. But people who, like, they grew all of this stuff from seeds uh, all the way kind of up to mature plants. And that's pretty cool. And I wouldn't have any idea where to start. And today's passage is a good example of this problem. Uh, We're in John chapter 15, and we're starting at verse 1. And Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the vineyard keeper. He removes any of my branches that don't produce fruit, and he trims any branch that produces fruit so that it will produce even more fruit. You are already trimmed because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I remain in, will remain in you. A branch can't produce fruit by itself, but must remain in the vine. Likewise, you can't produce fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. Without me, you can't do anything. If you don't remain in me, you will be like a branch that is thrown out and dries up. Those branches are gathered up, thrown into a fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified when you produce much fruit, and in this way prove that you are my disciples. Now, this passage is familiar to those of us who grew up in the church. It's one of those ones that people like to do the needle points about, I am the vine and you are the branches and pictures of vines and branches. And and I have preached and heard lots of messages on the whole vine and branch sort of thing. The problem is, it all seems like old hat, except that I know absolutely nothing about pruning, about vines. I mean, the only thing, I mean, I know uh, a lot about how to drink wine. Uh, Very good at that part of it. I've been practicing for a while. Um, But I don't know anything about about vines. I mean, plants is even one thing, but I mean, not very many of us have have vines, like grapevines, 
you know, it's not the kind of thing that you have in your home garden. I remember uh, at um, uh, Dave and Bev's old place, I, that might be the first people I knew who had a grapevine, like, at their house. Never seen that before, right? So I don't really, I, I don't know much about any of this stuff. So I had to do some reading this week that was a little different than my usual Bible study that I do getting ready for a uh, message. Uh, none during the preparation for the message. Uh, I had the, uh, the uh, barley and something else and hops, I guess, is what I was drinking for that. Uh, so here's what I got thinking about. So here's the thing. So most of us understand, I think, at least loosely, that uh, pruning is cutting dead branches off of a plant or a tree or something like that to make it grow better, which feels counterintuitive to me. If you cut things off of me, I feel like I am not going to grow better. In fact, I cut myself very regularly because I'm very clumsy, and generally speaking, it's not a productive, helpful thing when I cut stuff off of myself to make myself uh, grow better. And, and so I don't quite understand it, but the, the, all the experts and everything I read assured me that this is truth. So I did a bunch of reading. Here's why. Here's why. The engine, can you go, yeah, there we go. The engine that drives plant growth and plant health or vigor is kind of threefold. There are three things going on in a plant to ensure that a plant is healthy. Carbohydrates and nutrients are mobilized from stored reserves that are often stored in the roots and in the branches of the tree. There is the current photosynthesis that's going on in the leaves of the uh, plant. And then there's also the water absorption that is taking place in the roots, bringing water in. And these, kind, these three things have to exist in this really fancy pants balance, or you don't have a very healthy tree. If you don't have a good root system, you don't get enough water coming up. If you don't have uh, healthy branches, you don't have enough nutrient storage. And then you also then don't have enough uh, leaves, leaves and foliage to have enough photosynthesis, leaves like that, photosynthesis going on. And it was kind of this big deal. So, so here's what's happening, apparently, when we prune plants. The idea is, you know the next one, so you've got the tree before pruning, right? It's all about deciding where the energy is going to go. Because you've only got a limited amount of energy, apparently, because there's only so much uh, storage that's going to take place. And it's about trying to... Uh, to ensure where that energy is going to go. Now, most pruning is supposed to happen, apparently, in the wintertime, when plants are dormant. And it's about trying to make sure there's enough en sufficient energy stored for the growth that's going to take place in the spring. And then essentially what it is, is the more that we cut back, the more we ensure that what's going to grow in the spring is actually going to have all of the nutrients that it needs. Because if you've got too much going on, you don't end up having enough nutrients for everything to come back healthy. And instead, it comes back, but it, doesn't, it isn't able to really sustain itself, apparently. Keeps the plant from wasting too much of its energy on branches and on growth that is not, at the end of the day, going to contribute to the health. But here's the really crazy thing. is Most importantly, it contributes to actually more fruit production. Now, especially when it comes to grapevines, this is what I thought was kind of interesting. Because I, I, I looked up and I found these pictures of these grapevines in like really fancy pants vineyards after they're pruned in the winter. And like how much they cut them back, I don't even care. And I felt anxiety. Because I was like... There's nothing left because you see those pictures like this, right? You see this picture and it's, it's rich and it's full and it's vibrant and it's heavy with fruit. fruit. And then when you see the pictures of how much is cut back, it's like they, they cut the whole freaking thing away. And Now, here's the wild thing. In my head, you would think more branches, more fruit, right? More branches, there's more opportunity for little buds to grow and then turn into fruit. That makes sense. But what actually ends up happening is it's kind of true. More branches equals more fruit trying to grow. But what grows isn't healthy and will often then die or fall off or something like it. It isn't able to sustain it. But when you prune it back, the fruit that does grow is able to grow rich and full and healthy and be used for important things like the production of wine. <laughs> I 
And I can't get away from this idea that this passage sort of talks about how God wants to prune us a little bit. I don't like these passages of Scripture very much. Because there's this idea, there's this concept, there's this sense that somehow some of the things that we go through in life that are difficult, God actually seems to allow them because they tend to force us to come to terms with some of the things in our lives that maybe we need to get rid of. That there are behaviors, that there are habits, that there are things that we are doing in our lives that maybe need to be pruned back from our life. I mean, it's a question for us all to kind of think about. Are there things in your life right now that do not contribute to a healthy life? That don't contribute to your emotional well-being? That don't contribute to your physical well-being? That don't contribute to your spiritual well-being? Are there things, are there habits, are there behaviors, are there things in your life that you need to prune back that don't contribute to the relation, your relational well-being? to the community around you because, because they're not actually helping you to be the best version of yourself that you can be. See, this was the thing that I got thinking about with this whole pruning thing. When I was reading all the stuff about pruning grapevines, was that some of the branches that are cut off aren't dead. Like, in my head, I think before I kind of did any reading, you know, I was thinking, because Carrie made me watch this uh, British dude, um, Oh, now I can't remember his name. Anyways, he's a gardener. He does all these gardening shows. And often they're taking pictures of people pruning, and they're cutting off all of these, like, old dead branches. And that made sense to me. Well, you know, they they don't look very nice. But on these grapevines, they were cutting off branches that weren't dead yet. They were alive. They were growing. They just weren't overly healthy. And I got thinking about some of the things in our lives that maybe need to be pruned away, things that... It's not that the behavior, it's not that the habit, it's not that what we're talking about is necessarily horrible, right? It's not like I'm like, well, you know, for those of you who are doing heroin, you really need to prune that back from your life. I mean, because that's the thing, right? I think sometimes we think about, like, all of the really horrible stuff that we're doing. Well, yeah, I probably shouldn't do that anymore, you know? Uh, I was going to McDonald's every morning for breakfast, now I only do it six days a week, because I needed to prune back, you know what I mean? No, but it's not those things. Sometimes it's things that aren't bad in and of themselves, but we realize they aren't actually helping. You're cheering for the leaves. Oh, I just about... (laughs) I just about made a gesture on camera. (laughs) Anyways, uh, that was funny. My hand was like flying up to, to wave. With one finger. Uh, yeah. But no, actually, maybe this is a good idea. I mean, think about it. I mean, how, many, uh, uh, how much time do we spend on hobbies that aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves, but they take away from important relationships? They take away from the people around us. They, do you know what I mean? Are there things that you need to prune back? And then I couldn't help but think that we wish, we wish things always went smoothly in life. We wish... We wish that there weren't difficulties. We wish there weren't hardships. We wish there wasn't pain. We wish that that, that we didn't have to struggle. I had a moment this week. I I, I was spending some time praying this Thursday morning while I was driving, and uh, which is really dangerous because you have to close your eyes. But um, (laughs) but no, it was one of those. Sometimes when I swear on stage, there will be people who ask me, "Do you know?" would you swear if you were talking to God? And Thursday morning was one of those ones. There was a lot of swearing. Uh, God seemed to be all right with it. But because I, I was frustrated. I'm frustrated with life when it's difficult. And one of the worst parts about being a preacher is that, you know, you guys sit here and listen to this for half an hour. I've been thinking about it all week, feeling very convicted and frustrated with this passage of Scripture. And I, I wish that life didn't have to be hard all of the time. I couldn't help but think about the times where um, uh, David says in the Psalms, why do the wicked prosper? He looks at the people around him who are not living life the way God intended, and it seems like everything always goes amazing, right? But then I kind of thought about this reality that this isn't actually, that everything going smoothly isn't the best thing for us. That at the end of the growing season, leaving the grapevine full and big isn't actually the best thing for that grapevine. That will actually contribute to it dying, not contribute to it growing healthier and healthier and healthier. 
So I thought maybe when, the, when we're going through difficult times, if you're struggling right now, maybe like I was on Thursday morning, and you're struggling, and you're frustrated, and you're angry, maybe we should shift how we pray a little bit. Instead of praying like, God, I want it all to go away. I mean, I still did. But praying, but is there something in this? Am I not paying attention? Am I missing something that could actually help me grow stronger, healthier? Is there, something, is there something in this that you're letting happen because I need to change some things in my life? Maybe we pray that if we are going through difficult things, that it acts like this pruning that the Scripture's talking about. Now, that's all kind of old hat, and for those of you who've grown up in the church, you've heard that kind of stuff. But there's a difficult bit in this passage as well. Uh, sometimes I really wish that I could highlight my Bible with a black marker and make some things go away, and there's this kind of tough part. There's all this nice stuff about, uh, you know, Jesus saying, if you remain in me and I remain in you and you're going to produce fruit and it's going to be awesome and everything's wonderful, and you're like, oh, I like this passage of scripture. This is really nice. But then Jesus says, if you don't remain in me, you will be like a branch that is thrown out and dries up. Those branches are gathered up, thrown into a fire and burned. Thanks for coming this morning. Glad that you could be here. Now, uh, this is one of those passages of scriptures that people love to argue about. If you, you open up commentaries, people, smart people writing about this passage of scripture, and they all have these different ideas and arguments, and there's problems, there are questions that are difficult to sort of come to an answer. One of them is, is G, like, like who exactly is it that's being gathered up? Who's being pruned? Who's being gathered up? Who's being thrown into the fire? Because there's this whole question of, is this a whole, like, you know, people who actually think Jesus is real, people who don't, believers, non-believers, Christians, non-Christians, who exactly is this, right? And so there's this kind of argument that takes place. And then there's this idea, but, but if it's, like he's talking to the disciples, if it's, a, like if it's people who would call themselves Christians or followers of Jesus, like does that mean that you can, you can, to use old school language, can you lose your salvation? Is that what Jesus, like you were part of the vine, but now you're cut off of the vine? I mean, this, whew, that's, uh, why well, I don't know, is that what's going on here? And then there's this whole, there's this whole fire business. Well, you know, that's, that's not fun. Uh, what exactly is this fire? How far, how far can we push that metaphor? How far can we go with this idea that there, there's this, this, you know, gathering of the branches, and we're the branches, and then the branches are going into the fire. Ooh, it's not real fire. What kind of fire, Right. Is it just a metaphor? Now, Jesus, Jesus does tell the disciples that they don't need to worry because they've already made the cut. Pun intended. I was so proud of that this week, and none of you care. Seriously. I was so proud of that. I told Carrie it, and I said people are going to love it, and Carrie did not agree. Uh, it appears that she was correct, and I was not. Anyways. No, yeah, that and her butt. Um, <laughs> you won't give me the bird on stage. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm in so much trouble. Uh, before, dealing, uh, before dealing with all this stuff, I want to take a little bit of a trip to the book of Leviticus because we're already in trouble. And so we're going to go to the book of Leviticus because, I mean, if you want warm and fuzzy, if you want to feel good, if you want, you know... You go to the book of Leviticus. We did nine months there before, and that was a lovely time. And so uh, I thought, why not go to the book of Leviticus with all of its death pronouncements? But it's not all just rules and death pronouncements. That's not all it is. There's, there's actually a bunch of other stuff as well. So, like, here's a surprising passage in Leviticus chapter 26, starting at verse 3. So we've, in Leviticus, some of it is rough. And chapter 20 is a real good one. Chapter 20 has all the sex stuff. And at the end of lots of you're getting stoned. Uh, and not the good kind. And, uh, and so you come, come through all that. And then you end up in Leviticus chapter 26. And here's where, what you end up with. If you live according to my rules and keep my commands and do them, I will give you rain at the proper time. The land will produce its yield and the trees of the field will produce their fruit. 
Your threshing season will last until the grape harvest, and the grape harvest will last until planting time. You will eat your fill of food and live securely in your land. I will grant peace in the land so that you can lie down without anyone frightening you. I will remove dangerous animals from the land, and no sword will pass through it. You will chase your enemies, and they will fall before you in battle. Five of you will chase away a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase away ten thousand, and your enemies will fall before you in battle. I will turn my face to you, will make you fruitful and numerous, and keep my covenant with you. You will still be eating the, the previous year's harvest when the time will come to clear it out to make room for the new. I will place my dwelling among you and I will not despise you. I will rock, walk around among you. I will be your God and you will be my people. I like this passage because I, I think it lines up a lot with what we talk about here all the time. This idea that when the scriptures talk about things we should and shouldn't do is not because God was bored. As we went through the book of Leviticus years ago, we that was kind of the thing that we kept coming back to, is that if you get caught up in just seeing the rules, you miss the point. You miss what the passage is actually about. You miss that this idea of God's way of living makes sense. And then there's this idea in the scripture that actually kind of flows throughout a lot of it. This idea of, of living the way God created life to be lived sort of leads to this fruitfulness and this blessing. And there's this idea that, that the more we live that way and the more God blesses, the more uh, the land, like you talk, see how he talks about the land producing fruit, etc., etc., etc. And it's not just about God giving us a present for behaving. Do you know what I mean? It's not just because, oh, okay, you, you know, do you remember the charts when our kids were little? I remember Caleb was not overly thrilled about the reading thing. And so we had to have this like kind of chart every book that he read for school. Then he would get a little thing. And then at the end, at the end of the week, if he did enough, there was like a little prize that he could get. And, and then he read lots. Uh, and then I wanted a chart too, but for different things. But I, I was thinking about uh, this idea that, that sometimes we approach the scriptures and we think the scriptures are... Like, if I do the right things, then God will be pleased. If I do the wrong things, God will be angry, punish me, spank me, whatever, uh, and, you know, we burn. Or if I do the right things, then God will bless me like, like I'm winning a prize, I'm getting, I'm getting an award. But I don't think that's what's going on here. I think there's this idea of God saying, no, this fruitfulness, this blessing, this is the natural outcome of living life the way that I created it. Because it's, the, the fields are producing fruit because nobody's trying to hoard everything. There's, there's enough for everybody, and everyone's working together. Do you, do you know what I mean? And it's not just about that, but I, I want to draw your attention to verses 11 and 12, where God says, I will place my dwelling among you, and I will not despise you. I will walk around among you. I will be your God, and you will be my people. This idea of being at home with God. This idea that, that, that to live life that way is to, to, to be home. We talk about this with the word repent all the time. Most of us think about the word repent like the angry guy on the sidewalk, right? But it's this Hebrew concept of teshuva, which I've taught about. It's homecoming, it's to return, it's to go home, it's to go back to God, it's to go back to the way life was created to be lived. Homecoming. And then we're in the Gospel of John. Remember how John starts out his Gospel, 114, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among them. I like this passage because, as many of you know, the word for dwelt actually means tabernacled. It means that, and the Word became flesh and set up his tent among them. I like that. See? Backpacking. Isn't yes, it's not very ultralight. No, no. I think it took a lot of oxen. Oh man, wouldn't that be hilarious? Bring oxen on a backpacking trip? I bet you'd get some looks. <laughs> but God comes, he makes his home. Okay, so back to the New Testament. 
Frederick Gail Bruner is a, one of the guys we really like his commentary on this. And he does his own translation of all these passages as he's going through his commentary. And he actually points out the problem with our, you know, lack of an agrarian society and the majority of us not having grapevines anywhere near us to, like, you know, actually understand what's happening. And so he kind of changes this just a little bit. And so he says this. So here's his translation. I... I am the real root of the matter, and my father is the orchidist. Every branch in me that is not bearing fruit, he cuts off. And every branch that is bearing fruit, he cuts it back, prunes it, cleanses it, so that it may bear even more fruit. Already you disciples are cleansed, you cut back or purified. People, because of the word that I have spoken to you, make your home with me as I am with you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit all by itself, but only when, it, only when it makes its home in the root. No more can you bear fruit unless you are home with me. I am the root of the matter. You disciples are the branches. The individual making a home with me as I am with him or her, there is this person bearing much fruit. Because the fact of the matter is this. Apart from me, you can do absolutely nothing. If an individual is not making a home with me, he or she is thrown out like a dead branch and is withered. They gather such branches and throw them into the fire, and that person is burned. But if you disciples make your home with me, and if my words can find a home in you, well then, whatever you want, just ask for it, and it's yours. Here is how my Father is glorified. It's when you bear much fruit and so become discipled to me. You can see how I ended up in the Leviticus passage, this idea of this home that we make with God. When Carrie and I go backpacking, one of the most important decisions that we make is where we're going to set up camp, where we're going to put our tent. This past trip, we failed very miserably one night at that very important task and put our tent on this lovely beach with a beautiful sunset and uh, very quickly realized that it was wildly infested with, I think, the most sand flies I have ever experienced in my life. In, in minutes, my entire body was on fire. It felt like I had stripped to my underwear and rolled in pink insulation. It was horrible because we failed at the very important task of deciding where to make our home. This is what Jesus is saying in this passage. Where are you going to make your home? Where are you going to set up home? Where are you going to abide, which Heather's going to talk about next week? Where are you going to set up home? Because we have these choices to make all the time, don't we? What are we going to use as guiding principles for how we live our lives? It, it makes all the difference in the world. It will change everything. Do we make our home with Jesus or not? Do we make our home attached to the vine or not? Are we branches that, that, that find ourselves able to go all the way down to the root of the matter? I love that he calls Jesus the root of the matter. It is the, he is the most real reality that exists. Everything else is some shade of reality. All right, so what about the difficult passage? I guess we have to sort of talk about it. Now, I like how Bruner deals with this. I think this passage is a distraction. This, this little bit here is a distraction. Because we're very focused on the burning part, Right? And a lot of the church today really likes to focus on the burning part. We like to talk a lot about, I mean, there's still churches that want to talk about, like, try to scare people into heaven or something. And it's all about this idea of hell. And, and often, even in the pub, when people find out what I do, it's, it's one of the questions people will ask me, do you believe in hell? Do you believe in a literal hell? Do you believe in, in a place where we, you know, people burn in lakes of fire for all eternity? And I often sort of don't answer the question. For a couple of reasons, not the least of which is our denomination has a stance on that, which I have signed a little document, uh, and uh, I don't want to get fired yet again for another thing. But, but also because I think it misses the point. And so I kind of like, I like what Bruner does here. 
So this is a quote from the comment, his commentary. And he talks about the resident Christian, the one who's made their home uh, with Jesus, and then the non-resident Christian, the one who's decided to make their home in some other place or other way. So he says this, the experience of this non-resident Christian is described, I love this, with progressive gravity. The person is thrown out of what? The church, reality, a crucial relation. In any case, from Jesus in some sense. So the person is thrown out, is withered. How? Relationally, personally, prospectively, in any case, again, somehow in relation to Jesus. So the person is thrown out, withered. They, uh, they, uh, such, they gather and throw such branches and throw them into the fire, and that person is burned. Who are they? How burned? Hell on earth, hell after death. In any case, some awful judgment. Then he goes on and says, we should probably not know too much about Jesus' pictorial language, but we should surely take very seriously what Jesus is picturing and pray, dear Lord, please screw our heads on right and help us want to make our home with you and to be seriously aware of the dangers of not making this home, as you are clearly trying to teach us in this text. I like this way of dealing with it. He's not going to push it too far, because I think if you push it too far, it doesn't make any sense anymore. And if you push it too far, you lose sight of what Jesus is actually trying to say. And so what he says, look it. What Jesus is saying is that the choices that we make, and more importantly, the choice we make about where our home is going to be matters. It matters significantly, it matters eternally, and it, it makes all of the difference in how our lives play out. There's eternal and serious consequences, and we need to take that seriously. But I didn't want us to get the wrong idea. Because I have heard this preached so often about the dangers of hell and all this kind of stuff. And it's not what this passage is about. So what I want to do, there, uh, can you go to the next slide? So this is a screen grab from my Bible study software that I use. This program called Logos. And it has this fancy feature where if you're searching for something, it highlights uh, what you were searching for, and I happened to search for produce fruit, because I was looking, I read through a whole, t like, I wanted to see if I was right, that this theme goes throughout the scripture, and it does. No, uh, please go back. Back, please. Or f forward, sorry. Uh, go back to the produce fruit slide. There we go, thank you. Seven times. Seven times in this passage of Scripture it says produce fruit, produce fruit, produce fruit, produce fruit. And people preach about hell. See my point? Produce fruit, produce fruit, produce fruit, produce fruit. For Jesus, this idea that, that this connection with him actually changes us. We're different. We live different. We behave different. We feel different. Our relationships are different. Our community is different. The way that we work at our jobs is different. The way we are in, in, in our marriages and with significant others, the, the way we are with our children, the way we, like, do you see the idea that, that something changes in us? It's not just this lip service idea that somehow not only fruit is produced, but a shit ton of fruit is produced, right? Seven times. And so I was thinking to myself, okay, well, all right, great, but how? How? And the clue is actually the next slide. Because the word that shows up more than produce fruit is the word remain. Remain shows up eight times in that passage, and then you'll notice next week, because Heather's going to take that theme and go with it, because it continues on. Burned, one, one. But this idea of remain, this idea of stay connected, this idea of not running away and trying to push ourselves away from God, this idea of, uh, of abiding, this idea of remaining. Because remember what we started talking about. Nothing can grow unless it's connected to where the nutrients are stored, where that energy for life is found. 
We cannot exist in this world living as the people that God has called us to be if we are not somehow connected to the source of life, to the source of all that is, to the source of, uh, of where we are going to get the energy, the nutrients, and able to produce that fruit and able to make a difference in the world. So when you're struggling... When life is tough, when you're having a moment like I was this week, when you're having one of those prayer times filled with words that maybe aren't the most pastory, how connected are you? Are you remaining? Or maybe you've let yourself get a little too busy. Maybe you've let yourself get focused on a bunch of stuff that doesn't really matter. Maybe maybe you've gotten disconnected from the source of life. Maybe it's time to reconnect in whatever way that works for you. Go for a hike, spend some time in prayer, go on a prayer retreat, get some incense and meditate. Whatever it is for you that actually reconnects you, grounds you, centers you, brings you back to that root of all matter. Next week, I'm hopeful Heather is going to talk more about that and what that looks like, (laughs) judging by the songs that she wants me to sing next week. I think so. Because I think it's kind of the key. Is that God wants to see our lives actually look different. It matters to him how they look. We need to take that seriously. And we need to then remind ourselves that it is important to stay connected to the source of all that is to remain And we do that, by the way, we do that together and apart. Over the years, most of you know that I struggle with church. I struggle with this thing that we do. I mean, all of us kind of do. It's how we all ended up here. We struggle with church. Struggle with this weird thing that we do. It's weird. And we tried to sort of get away from it, tried to find other things and tried to like, you know, come up with different things to do on a Sunday morning. And, and then the pandemic happened and some people were like, sweet, I got an out, right? And, and then, you know, kind of, we all kind of came back, but we didn't all sort of come back. And then we started to kind of trickle back in because at the end of the day, there's something incredibly powerful about this, about together. We wrestle with these questions together. We We worship together, we pray, even though we're all in sort of different comfort levels with that. Together we 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 talk about our lives and we share coffee and and we share life. Because that that's part of remaining. It's part of staying connected. It's part of what keeps pulling us back in. And we've all had those moments where we've wanted to sort of run away and we've got pulled back in again. But then it's also something that has to happen on our own as well. And something that needs to happen more regularly than it probably does for a lot of us. Where we take time to spend time talking with God in whatever way that looks like for you. And so we remain in community and we remain individually as well. Let's pray. Dad, I want to pray for those who are... um, I want to pray for those who feel disconnected. I pray for those who, who this idea of being connected to anything that even resembles something like a source of life just seems far-fetched. Um, for those who feel, feel exhausted, burnt out, stressed out, struggling, for those who feel like when I talk about difficult times that that's just all that life is sometimes. I pray for a sense of comfort and, and, and connection in the middle of all of that. The difficult moments in our lives, Lord, are so loud sometimes. And so, God, for those who are feeling that, I pray, I, I pray that it would quiet down and that they'd be able to hear, see, sense your presence. For those that out even seems like a strange concept, I pray, God, that, that it would make sense to them somehow. And then I pray for strength and comfort. I pray for courage. God, for those who, who know that there are things in their lives that need pruning, that there are habits, behaviors, choices they're making that are not healthy, that are not helping them 
to be the best versions of themselves, God. I pray for courage to get rid of those things and strength. And then, God, I pray for grace, too. I pray, God, that that those of us that know we struggle with some of that kind of stuff, we would have grace towards ourselves. Not shame and guilt, but a desire to actually grow and change. And then, God, for us as a church, I pray that in this place, it will be a place where people are welcomed, where people feel a sense of love and community and connection, a place that doesn't feel like you're walking into a room filled with judgment and condemnation, but a room filled with grace and acceptance. But I pray in the midst of all that that we would continue to be a community that calls each other out when we need to and encourages each other to continue to be the best versions of themselves, to grow into the people that Jesus would be if Jesus was us. So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Ask worship team to come on up.